time, we're going to go through some of the question and answers. There's been several posted on the Q&A form. Some have been answered in text form, but we're going to go through them um, orally here as well. Let's go with Bill first. One of the questions was on, um, well, I think this question ended up going to both, uh, both Bill and Doug, but you know, the, the waste being land applied. And I think with the alligators, you showed us the demonstration of the irrigation, Doug. Um, Bill, are there is some of the solid material, some of the solid, um, solid matter from the nutrients land <coughs> Well, in, in all reality, the, the biggest part of uh, waste that we get from fish is after processing. And uh, there's, there's actually two things we do with that. Uh, well, there's more than that. Uh, we, we have a large mink industry here, and that, that's one of the primary, one of the best uh, resources to use for the mink industry, whether, whether you like mink or not, the farming. But, but that's one thing. Um, we have a large company here that makes fish hydrolysate, and I actually make that too. And basically, it's uh, um, it's digesting the everything that you don't eat. Uh, so that's uh, the head, all the innards, and the scales, everything, the skin, um, whatever you don't eat uh, is digested in a cold digestion process, and you make uh, a fish hydrolysate, which is quite a bit different than. Uh, uh, the stuff you can buy in the store. This is a, um, it doesn't uh, smell as bad. It's not cooked uh, or um, any of the nutrients taken out of it. So it's, uh, if you can buy fish hydrolysate made that way, it's an organic supplement and, and people that are in the, um, uh, the gardening business, the flower gardens and the vegetable gardens, they just love it. Um, uh, and then it can also be used like uh, for alfalfa fields and it can be spread. the guys with the deer farms you might be interested also love it because of their food plots uh, are it's a high priority item um, and I'm trying to think of another but anyway I also have um, the high schools use it in uh, hydroponics so we can take fish hydrolysate and use it directly and get rid of all the other fertilizers and they um, they actually like it better than any other first uh, synthetic fertilizer that they've bought. So, okay. um, but then the other side of that is you can directly apply fish waste right to soil too. Um, and that's uh, in large processing facilities, that's what they do. Okay. So there's, it's almost nothing wasted on, on that side. Good. Um, Doug, on your end with alligator farming, the, the waste, uh, the nutrient material can be land applied and you demonstrate an irrigation system. Have you seen alligator manure being applied using other systems? Yes. All right. Uh, yeah, actually, Ron, one of the things he was doing was trying to precipitate, uh, although he was not really looking that as a, as a, uh, a fertilizer, mm -hmm. more of an industrial source of phosphate. Uh, the I was looking at the analyses. The, uh, the if you had some kind of solid separation, the solid portion of of the the pond waste was, is almost all phosphorus, um, and it's pretty good. That it, it's basically all phosphorus, and then the liquid portion is about uh, looks like about a hundred to one uh, TKN to, to phosphate. So it, it's uh, if you could separate the solids and store it in a way that would, or maybe digest it so they wouldn't smell so much, that would make a very good phosphorus fertilizer um, that could be transported long ways. And for cropping systems, the uh, through irrigation, uh, basically, uh, if you uh, separate the solids, then you would, you could uh, apply it to an irrigation system like a center pivot. Um, so I uh, know there's no there's nothing that would uh, keep you from using it other than the odor control. Thanks, um, Brandon. To you, Doug just brought up transportation of manure and the, the moisture content of the manure plays into that. You compared the moisture content between the different types of cervids. Do you want to comment on that and and the application of that to transport transportability of the manure? I will, and that was one question that came up in the Q&A uh, typed in, and I tried to respond to that a minute ago. Um, 
one of the big things we see, especially in the county where I am in Texas, is we used to be the largest dairy capital in Texas. It has since moved to the panhandle. Uh, the big thing about dairy, especially dairy manure, dairy effluent, the limitation is water content. It is only viable for a couple of miles, and after that, the break even no longer makes sense for application. So we're not even as worried with, yes, there are environmental regulations, there are environmental concerns on application, but a lot of that environmental concern becomes we only have a finite area where it can be applied and then we can't apply it any further. That's really, and I can't say that any deer farming operations are making use of this right now, but that's where I see the next big thing, the big opportunity is, this is a dry manure. You don't have the energy input of drying it down before it can be used. So we've got a ready-made product that all it needs to be done is transport. Good, thank you. Uh, Bill, a question to you, uh, reiterating one that came through the, through the Q&A. Um, with aquaculture, what are thoughts about keeping prices competitive with foreign markets, such as Southeast Asia? Uh, well, you know, right now, 90 some percent of everything that we do is um, imported. Uh, and it's, it's strange, very difficult to get our arms on it. And I've been working on that for about 20 years. Um, fortunately, I'm raising a, a product that doesn't have any competition, but I, um, the, the biggest one I see is uh, that people are, are growing is tilapia, and a lot of them are, are doing tilapia. Well, they have to do it indoors or even far south, but uh, tilapia is uh, warm water. I think about 80 degrees is optimum. Um, but when you come to process it, um, almost none of it is processed in the United States, and that's a killer. Um, they have another a double set of bones, and uh, I've been trying to figure out what to do with it because of all the big markets or the big tilapia producers that I know of, um, none of them sell their fish processed, and that means that they all have to go to live markets. And um, and I never even would have thought of that. But and, and so you're you're strapped with uh, a large trucking live fish to live markets, and there's only a few big cities that can take large quantities of that. Um, so that I mean that's just one species. I know for a long, long time, uh, and I, I'm straying out of my my expertise. Uh, but the catfish farmers were doing real well, and then they uh, had import problems and they uh, had some serious problems, but it's always going to be a problem. And, and uh, I work with the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center. I'm on their board and we are constantly looking for uh, species to raise that we can do economically. And that's the key. Uh, so as you saw in my charts, a lot of the fish that we're raising now are non-indigenous species to our, our state. And uh, we're trying to do more and more. Uh, shrimp is coming in. I think the markets for shrimp will be very strong if we can uh, get the technology down. Uh, if we can get the perch going, that'll be big. Uh, we're working on walleye too. And uh, the perch and the walleye, um, aren't, there's no competition from Asian imports at all. So, I mean, there's, you've got to pick your species but you have to pick your economics too, and it's not that simple. <laughs> well, I don't know about the rest of the audience, but through all three presentations, I kept hearing some very strong similarities to those species that we are a lot more familiar with in livestock farming. Doug, a question for you as I look outside my window here in Minnesota as the snowstorm and blizzard has started. Why are the alligators in Louisiana generally kept under roof? Uh, I think, uh when I was researching for this, I think most of the ones in Florida are also kept under roof. Okay. Um, I think it's because they, well, they won't escape for one thing. <laughs> and the other thing is probably they get a better product if they can control the climate. Um, heat is, uh, you saw those buildings were very well insulated, but I don't think heat is that big of a problem for them, particularly if they have the sprinklers. But they get a better control over the, the leather, which is their money maker mostly. Okay, makes sense. Um, Brandon, another question for you. With, um, with the, in Texas or, or larger region, if you're familiar with it, 
what is the, the main, uh, for the different species of cervids, what, what is the main purpose of, of raising them? Is it for the hunting or is it for the, for the meat or other reasons? Uh, the hunting is always going to be the biggest deal, um, especially in this state, but I know in other areas too, uh, big game ranches have popped up and it's becoming a bigger thing. We, we're losing some public lands, so there are not as many native populations. We've got disease issues, chronic waste mm -hmm. disease being the biggest one among servants. They're taking out some of the uh, wild populations. So it's going to be the big game farming. Uh, marketable meat is always going to take a second place to it, if for no other reason than the margins. Okay. I'm not seeing any more questions come up in the Q&A. Um, so I think we'll, we'll start wrapping it up here. I want to thank our three speakers, Brandon, Doug, and Bill, for sharing their uh, sharing their background and, and their insights into these less than typical species for the rest of us.